Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'la habita fillah I wanted to discuss something which is very important and that is the zeal or the desire for the new Muslim to be perfect in Islam and practice Islam perfectly and this is a very beautiful thing to be as complete and honest and sh forthright in practicing one's worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a lot of us who have reverted or converted to Islam that we experience that zeal, that joy as a new Muslim, that you want to do those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has commanded us to do, and you want to do it in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And however, because of a lack of knowledge, most of the time we may have the zeal and we may read, we read Bukhari and Muslim, we read the Quran, and we try to practice but we don't have the prerequisite knowledge of really how to understand those texts that we read nor uh, or and the problem with that is that it is a tendency to only have and actualize one of those conditions for having our deeds accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is ikhlas, as we mentioned, that sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is from the foundations of the religion. It's from the foundation of having your deeds accepted. In order to have your deeds accepted as a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you have to have a sincerity to Allah. You have to have ikhlas in your ibadah. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهُ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ And they weren't commanded except that they worship Allah with sincerity. And for him is the religion, you know, with complete sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second condition is that you do it in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That means your acts of worship has to be done in accordance with how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did those actions. That, I don't think, is a problem in, uh, in accepting those two foundation principles. But when you don't have the prerequisite knowledge, even if you read those divine texts, then it's easy to misunderstand and distort the principles of Islam. So what happens is that the honest Muslim who's striving, they read and they try to practice. But again, because of not really understanding all of those, the context of those texts, that's very important, and how to understand and practice how the pious predecessors practice and understood. And again, contextualizing those texts and knowing what those texts really mean and how to implement them. That this is something that the new Muslim uh, lacks. And so with this being the case, often or sometimes, this zeal can lead to a person becoming extreme. And they can either become first uh Extreme, I want to talk about being extreme in one or two ways. Number one, extreme in their worship. Or number two, extreme in their desire to command the good and forbid the evil. So the first way, the ghulu, uh, or being extreme in worship. The Prophet ﷺ said, Iyakum wa ghulu. He وسلم, said, beware of uh, extremism or being extreme. And some of the ways in which a person can be extreme, meaning extreme, as Sheikh Salih bin Fuzan, a great scholar uh, here in Saudi Arabia, mentions that ghulu uh, is tajawuz uh, al-had. It means to go beyond the boundary. So, for example, if Islam tells you to be like this, you are going outside of those boundaries by transgressing, by going beyond the limits of Islam. So this is ghulu, 
even though you have the desire to adhere to the Islam, but yet you're going beyond what Islam calls you. You are going outside and in fact falling into bid'ah without even being aware of doing so, meaning you follow into religious innovation. And some of the ways in which people can be uh, have halu or extremism in their worship, one of the ways, for example, as we see the nations that uh, came before us, like the Christians, that they have halu or uh, <clears throat> they have extremism in their love for Jesus, alayhi salatu wasalam. The Muslim loves Jesus, alayhi salatu wasalam, in the best way, in the way that he should be loved and revered, but not exalted to the extent of worship not worshiping him, not saying he's the son of God and giving him divinity, but rather we put everyone in their proper place and we believe he was one of the best of mankind and one of the best of the prophets. May peace and blessings be upon them all. Salawatul Rabbi wa salamuhu alayh. And with that being the case, also other ways in which a person can be uh, have halu in their worship, for example, even celebrating uh, the birthday of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because the Prophet sallam, didn't do it, didn't order us to do it. The Sahaba didn't do it. Neither did the Salaf al Salih. They didn't do these practices. These were not practices known to them. They did not do this. So for us, if we restrict our worship and our reverence to that, to the ways in which they did and the way they revered the Prophet وسلم, and loved and respected him وسلم, then that will be sufficient. And then we don't have to worry about engaging in un-Islamic practices, practices that indeed have no place in Islam and came from foreign sources to Islam and from the people of innovation and the people of Shirk. Uh, another way in which we can have halu, uh, extremism in worship, uh, celebrating non-Islamic holidays like having, uh, you know, celebrating the New Year, or celebrating uh, Christmas. In fact, what amazes me is that uh, many Muslims, in their desire to be one with other communities and to have tolerance with other communities, that they go to such an extreme to do so that they resemble them in everything. The Prophet said, whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. The Prophet said, the Prophet وسلم, said that you would follow the nation. You will follow the way of those people who came before you, uh, footstep by footstep, or handspan by handspan. Even if they entered the hole of a lizard, you would follow them. And they said, Who are they, Ya Rasulullah? Meaning the Sahaba, they asked about this. And he وسلم, said, uh, The the Jews, uh, they said, the Who are. Uh, Ya Rasulullah, is it the Jews and the Christians? The Prophet Sallallahu said, who else? So letting us know that we would follow their ways. And in some narrations it mentions shirk. And also in the hadith of Abi Waqith al-Laythi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who said that we were, uh, that we were new to Islam. You know, we were new to Islam and they were traveling to, to, to the battle in Hunayn. And then they asked for, uh, they asked for uh, a tree as the Mushrikeen, the pagans of that time, the Arab pagans, used to have trees which they would hang their weapons on seeking blessings. And so the Sahaba, they asked for a tree like theirs. They said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, ij'al lana that al wat kama lahum that al wat O Messenger of Allah, make for us a uh, that alone what? Like their, their, um, their tree that they seek blessings from, make for us a tree to seek blessings from. So this illustrates another way in which new Muslims can end up following the sunnah or the way of the people 
uh, before them and by uh, following their way that even the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that some of the people would fall into shirk from the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam so by copying other people's festivities and the way that they do things this can make us go beyond the bounds of the Islamic boundaries again ghulu or extremism so that shows us some of the ways in which we can have extremism in worship and another way in which we can have extremism in worship as uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned uh, in the hadith where <clears throat> there were three individuals who were uh, they wanted to know about how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, you know how how his worship was and so one <clears throat> said I will not marry and uh, you know I, I will never get married Okay, another one said, I will fast and I will not break my fast. And another said, I will uh, pray uh, in the, the, you know, the full extent of the night, even to such an extent of maybe tying themselves up to, to keep themselves alert. This hadith illustrates for us that this is how a person can become extreme in their worship. They want good. So they had sincerity. All the three of them had sincerity. They had a class. They met the condition for having their deed accepted, one of the conditions. But the other condition was following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't do that. He would, uh, he would fast and he would break his fast. He married women, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he uh, stood for a portion of the night and rested. Okay. So he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, gave us that proper balance. But those who wanted, they wanted good, but they didn't attain good. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Whoever desires uh, other than my sunnah is, is, is not from me. So it lets us know that the Prophet ﷺ gave us that, that proper ba balance. And this is what we need to strive for as a new Muslim. We need to gain the proper knowledge so we can have the proper balance. So we can follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam properly by not being too extreme and too extreme upon ourselves to where we can't be consistent in our acts of worship. Don't make it everything hard upon yourself and, and then you're, you're making tajid uh, every night and you're, you're doing it and you're doing it at odd hours, it's making you late for work, whatever the case may be, and then after a while you just leave it completely. Maybe you even leave the prayer. This We've seen this countless times from experience. So you have to be careful of extremism and worship. The other type of extremism, which we also definitely need to be concerned about as a community, and this as a new Muslim, is the zeal to command the good and forbid the evil. Because we know the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khadri, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, who said, Sana'atu Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, yaqool, min ra'a minkum munkarin fa ghayruhu bi yad, fa in lam yastati' fa bi lisanihi, fa in lam yastati' fa bi qalbihi, wa thalika adu fa liman. Ruahu Muslim. This is a hadith in Sahih Muslim, where Abi Sa'id al-Khadri, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, that I heard the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever sees a good, then change it with his uh, hand. If he's unable to do so, change it with his tongue, speak out against it. And if he's unable to do so, then change it with his heart. And that's the weakest form of faith. In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu we see the importance of commanding the good. That this was the way and this is a sunnah of the, the salihin, of the righteous people. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Quran, to command the good and forbid the evil. However, that comes with understanding the religion properly. It doesn't come from you reading Bukhari and Muslim and then running and, and thinking that you can uh, implement Sharia punishments, or that you can do this, or you can do this, or you should be harsh with the people, or you should always chastise and curse the people. And I've seen this countless times and been a part of that myself as a new Muslim and seen countless uh, destructive practices because of this extremeness and a lack of understanding. Zeal without understanding. How many times, I know a particular brother, may Allah forgive us in him, who's the imam for a particular 
or portion of time, uh, a period of time, reading Bukhari, he said, no, you don't, this hadith says this, you don't have, you, you don't need a wali, sister, you can marry yourself. This is because of a lack of understanding. A lack of what? A lack of fiqh fi deen. Man yirid Allahu bi khayran yifakaw fi deen. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives them understanding of the religion. So it takes fiqh, it takes understanding the religion. It's not just we read and we run and we try to implement without understanding, without fiqh. Likewise, with uh, another uh, problem that can arise is this extremism can lead to uh, and that the, the, the ulama mentioned that in relation to this hadith that it requires fiqh, that it requires understanding of the religion to be able to know how to implement the good and forbid the evil. You have to know what is good and you have to know what is evil. That comes from ilm, it comes from knowledge, sound Islamic knowledge. And it isn't just that you know that this haram or something, but there's a fiqh with that as well. There's looking at the masalih and the mufasid, there's looking at the harms and the benefits with regards to that issue. So perhaps you may cause more harm by trying to command good or by trying to uh, forbid something evil or something wrong than, you other, than otherwise the original sin. For example, if someone says, hey, brother, uh, to a new Muslim. In fact, when I was just back in, in America, I saw a new brother. He probably fresh out of the, the penitentiary. He had an earring. He had tattoos all over his face. Now, if I were to approach him, Achi, what are you doing in the masjid? Da, 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 da. You know, you have all these tattoos and stuff. Not knowing anything about the brother. Not knowing uh, his situation, that he's a new Muslim. Whatever the case may be. Or that it's difficult any way to change that. But my point is, by, not, by you wanting to change something and, you know, forbid a wrong that you may cause a greater wrong by him leaving Islam. By him, if he's strong, maybe him knocking you out. Whatever the case may be, the point being a habit of Allah is that it takes fiqh fi deen. And it takes knowing the good and forbidding the evil and knowing what, what it entails and having fiqh of the people and fiqh of the situation. Understanding of all of those things. That is all a part of that. And that's what we lack a lot of times as new Muslims and even as Muslims that are born. A lot of times the average Muslim lacks those things. They don't know what is really the harms and the benefits. They don't know really fiqh fi deen. They don't really have al a nafi to be able to deal with situations. And so then it can result in great harms and evil. Along with this commanding and good and forbidding the evil, we see that the Khawarij, the original group that used to make takfir of other Muslims for their sins, that they were very, uh, they exalted this principle to such an extent that there was no looking at harms and benefits. They looked at only what they saw was good and what they saw as evil and they adhered sternly to it. That's that extremism. That's that extremism because you don't have fiqh fi deen. You don't have proper understanding of how to implement those tools. The Prophet wasallam said about those that sect, about those groups, he said, al khawarij kilab al nar The Khawarij are the dogs of the hellfire. Now, if you read the reports and all of the information and you even see the literature from groups like ISIS and groups like uh, 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 Al-Qaeda and other groups that are affiliated with them, you'll see how extreme they are. And they will make it, they will try to beautify by mentioning statements of some of the Salaf and those things which support their practices, but however, no fit, no understanding, to such an extreme, those kind of people, they will make takfir of one another, that you're not, uh, you're not extreme enough, or this one thinks this one is too extreme, they make takfir and they shed each other's blood. It shows you the wickedness of not understanding the religion. And this is where the danger of being overzealous can lead you. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil, and protect us from sharm, and protect the ummah from the extremism of uh, in in all of its various forms. Wassalamu alaikum wa sallam ala Muhammad.